important part of that introduction was missed, and that is the fact that I am the parent of 12 children. And no, that is not a joke. We had nine natural children and adopted three so that we could get to the number 12, and it has been one of the greatest blessings of my life. I'm traveling around the world these days and always traveling with my children, so it has been an incredible blessing. I want to start by focusing our minds for just a moment on the New Jerusalem. Remember the words of John, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the new Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Behold, I make everything new. He who was seated on the throne said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is our true hope. And every one of us, as we sit here in an auditorium in Bethlehem, are about one heartbeat away from that reality. In the meantime, ideas have consequences, and we are called to make our lives count while there is yet time. Given the limited time frame that I have, I'm going to condense my remarks. I'm going to, because of the seriousness of the subject, limit myself to an outline. But I hope that you get two points today. One is that the promises God made to Abraham have been fulfilled. Not one of them has failed. Secondly, we must recognize a salient reality, which is that God has only one chosen people, one covenant community, beautifully connected by the cross, and illustrated by the Apostle Paul by a cultivated olive tree. Those are the salient truths that I hope you walk away with after the next 20 or so minutes. My topic of biblical response to Christian Zionism. Remember, Christian Zionism predates secular Zionism by more than half a century. Again, bearing incredible truth to the notion that ideas have consequences. A biblical response to Christian Zionism, again constructed along two major theological fault lines. Let me start by saying that anti-Semitism is a horrific evil, especially when it is justified in the name of religion. Hitler 
needed no such pretext. His belief that Jews were subhuman and Aryan supermen funded a mad rush towards ethnic cleansing. As the smoke from the crematoriums wafted over steeples in the German countryside, another evil reared its ugly head. German pastors remained largely silent. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was not among them. If we claim to be Christians, he said, there is no room for expediency. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And on April 9, 1945, by direct order of Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler, he was hanged at the camp in Flossenburg. Ironically, perhaps, three years to the day that Bonhoeffer was martyred in the struggle against anti-Semitism, another Semitic horror unfolded on the outskirts of Jerusalem at Dar Yassin. You can see it from the Holocaust Museum. Before the day had ended, more than 100 Arabs, mostly non-combatants, were murdered. And that was only the beginning. By 1948, Zionist murder, terrorism, and ethnic cleansing drove upward of 750,000 Palestinians from their land and from their home, and that has produced today the largest displaced people group in the world. For cultural Zionists, ethnic cleansing is a defensible cruelty. But catch this. That is for cultural Zionists. They say it is a defensible cruelty, but Christian Zionists call it a divine command. From John Nelson Darby in the past to dispensationalists in the present, they forward the notion that God has covenanted to give Eretz Israel exclusively to the Jews. And when I talk about Eretz Israel, we're not just talking about Palestine. We're talking about a landmass approximately 30 times the present size of Israel and Palestine combined. We're talking essentially about the Levant and more. And this contention raises a question of greatest import. Does the promise to Abraham, to your descendants I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, provide a rationale for ethnic cleansing? Moreover, does that promise remain unfulfilled in the present day? To begin answering this question requires an understanding that the land promises God made to Israel have been fulfilled. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but read your Bibles. There is no question that in the near future or the for future, those promises were fulfilled in Joshua even as the life was ebbing from his body, he thanked God for fulfilling the promises that he had made to Abraham. Solomon, during which the children of Israel encompassed the land from the Euphrates to the Nile, were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, they lived, they served the Lord at the height of the Solomonic kingdom. The promise God made to Abraham was fulfilled. Many other examples could be cited. Nehemiah comes to mind. If any prophet 
had the right to extol God to fulfill his promises in light of the exile. It was Nehemiah, but he didn't ask God to fulfill the promises. He thanked God that the promise had been fulfilled. In the four future, they were fulfilled when the children of Israel entered the promised land. In the far future, they are typologically fulfilled in the Lord, and in the final future, the promise of the land will be fully and finally consummated when paradise lost is reconstituted as paradise restored. Canaan is thus typological of a renewed cosmos. Accordingly, Abraham was anything but a Zionist. Like Isaac and Jacob, he viewed living in the promised land in the same way that a stranger would view living in a foreign country. Why? Because as the writer of Hebrews makes plain, he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect, whose builder was God. While we might well define and defend the right of the secular state of Israel to exist. The contention that modern state of Israel is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy is indefensible. And while Jerusalem remains an important historical site as the typological city of David, the holy birthplace of Christianity, There is neither biblical nor historical warrant for treating it as the object of our eschatological hope. Actually, it is in Jesus, not Jerusalem, that we come face to face with the glory and presence of the living God. The essential point of understanding for John as well as for the rest of the disciples began to dawn at the time of Christ's post-resurrection appearances. Previously, they had been under the same misconception as modern-day Zionists. They expected Jesus to establish Jerusalem as the capital of a sovereign Jewish empire, the notion so ingrained in their psyches that even as Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, they said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus not only corrected their erroneous thinking, he expanded their horizons from a tiny strip of land on the east coast of the Mediterranean to the farthest reaches of the earth. You will receive power, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In effect, Jesus left his disciples with instructions to exit Jerusalem, embrace the earth, and never again entertain the thought of establishing an earthly Jerusalem. Finally, a quick word about the temple. In the context of ancient Israel, Solomon's temple stood as a glorious symbol of God's imminent presence on the earth was therefore a devastating blow to their spiritual and sociological identity when the Babylonians destroyed the temple in 586 BC. And while Jesus never uttered a single word about a third temple, he emphatically prophesied the ruin of the second. Do you remember his words? He had just walked out of the temple grounds And his disciples began calling his attention to its buildings. And he said, you see all these things, I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Later on, Jesus encountered the disciples again on the Mount of Olives. And they asked him, when will this happen? They weren't talking about the end of the world. They were talking about what he had just said. The temple the center of their sociological and spiritual identity is going to be destroyed. When will this happen? And what will be the time of your coming, not coming as in second coming, but coming as used by the Old Testament prophets, coming in judgment? 
and when will be the age ending time of sacrifice. They wanted to know when the temple in Jerusalem would not be manifestly desecrated, but manifestly destroyed. And Jesus said all of that would take place within a generation. I have to say this. It is a sad reality today that not only secularists, but Christian Zionists have taken Christ's words out of context. Christian adversaries say that Christ is a false apocalyptic prophet. Why? Because he said within a generation he would return. He didn't return within a generation and therefore no amount of obfuscation on the part of Christians can absolve him from false prophecy. But Jesus was not talking about his second coming. He was talking about his coming in judgment. He was using the language of the Old Testament prophets and now applying it to the destruction of Jerusalem. Moreover, let me say this, the Shekinah glory of God will never again descend upon a temple constructed of lifeless stones. Why, it forever dwells within the living stone rejected by men, chosen by God. As Peter explains, you also are living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, a holy priesthood that offers spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Christ. The type, the shadow of the first century temples find their substance not in a tribulation temple, then followed by a millennial temple, but in a church built out of living stones comprised of Jew and Gentile with Jesus Christ himself, the capstone. All of the types, all of the shadows of the old covenant have been fulfilled in the Holy Christ. It is paradise, a new heaven, a new earth, not Palestine for which our hearts yearn. It is the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully adorned for her husband, upon which we fix our gaze. It is the master teacher, not a majestic temple that forever satisfies our deepest longings. The first fault, then, is to imagine that the holy land, the holy city, and the holy temple continue to have theological significance. They have historical significance. But they no longer have theological significance. A second major theological fault line underlying Christian Zionism is the notion that God has two distinct people. It arose with a 19th century Dissolution priest from the Church of England who joined with a, separatari- a, a, a separatist millenari- millenarian a movement called the Plymouth Brethren. And he did it in 1831, about the same time that Darwin sailed off into evolutionary fame. Like Darwin, Darby was a trendsetter. He contended that God had two distinct people with two distinct plans and two distinct destinies. And only one of those people, the Jews, would suffer tribulation. The other, the church, would be removed from the world in a secret coming seven years prior to the second coming of Christ. And that distinctive twist on scripture known as dispensational eschatology is now the reigning eschatology in certainly the West. And though it is wildly popular, there is nothing biblically to commend it. 
far from communicating a distinction between Israel and the church, the scripture from beginning to end reveals that God has only ever had one chosen people. In fact, the precise terminology that is used to describe the children of Israel in the Old Testament is ascribed to the church in the New Testament. Peter calls them a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Ultimately, they are the one chosen people of God, not by virtue of their genealogical relationship to Abraham, but by virtue of their genuine relationship to the living stone rejected by God and chosen by men. May I say it plainly? God is not a racist. He does not choose you based on your birth mother. He chooses you based on your relationship to Yahweh, the God of Israel, revealed in Jesus Christ. Nor is God a land broker. He's not a real estate agent. Land does not belong to a people because of their genetic evidence. Ultimately, this is a matter of relationship, not race. Furthermore, the Old and the New Testament reveal only one covenant community. While this one covenant community is physically rooted in the offspring of Abraham, it is spiritually grounded in one singular seed. Now read Galatians 4. Munther mentioned this. It's a passage we should be familiar with. Galatians chapter 3, I should say. Where Paul says that Abraham only had one seed. Not seeds plural, he says, but seed singular. The royal seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. The double entendre by the time you get to the end of the chapter is that if you are in Jesus Christ then you are the seed of Abraham and an heir according to the promise. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek, or for that matter, Jew and Palestinian, or whether you're slave or free, or whether you're male or female. It has nothing to do with gender. It has nothing to do with nationality. It has nothing to do with your station in life. If you are in Christ, you are the royal seed of Abraham and an heir according to the promise. The one chosen people of God who form one covenant community are beautifully symbolized in the book of Roman as one cultivated olive tree. The tree symbolizes Israel, the branches, those who believe. The root, Jesus Christ, the root and the offspring of David. Branches broken off represent those who disbelieve. Branches grafted in those who believe. Put another way, it is not the natural children who are God's children. It is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Jesus is the one genuine seed of Abraham and all clothed in Christ constitute one congruent chosen covenant community beautifully connected by the cross. Dispensational eschatology continues to morph from its humble beginnings in the British Isles. It is today the norm, not the abnormality. And those who question the notion of a pre-tribulational rapture followed by a Holy Land Holocaust in which the vast majority of Jews perish are shouted down as peddlers of godless heresy. It's been mentioned this morning, but the ultimate pejorative phrase has been coined for those who deny the heart of dispensational eschatology. They're dubbed replacement theologians. They're said to be guilty of carrying Hitler's anointing and his message. One can only pray for the courage to stand in the face of vilification 
and to do all that is permissible to see that this pseudo-eschatology fades into the shadowy recesses of history. May I say it plainly, God is not pro-Jew. He's pro-justice. He's not pro-Palestinian. He's pro-peace. The bottom line is this. The land promises for the one people of God are ultimately fulfilled not in an earthly Palestine, but in an eternal paradise. That is the grand meta-narrative of Scripture. The first 11 chapters, if you will, are sort of like an episode catch-up. It's the main macro issues in past episodes. And then we get to God calling Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. And from that, an unfolding plan of redemption that culminates in a new heaven and a new earth. One of the angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, let me show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. It shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There are three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. This is the 144,000. It is the full complement of God's people. The bride, the wife of the Lamb, pictured as the holy city Jerusalem. Foundation, the apostles and the prophets, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ himself. That is our hope, and that is precisely what I close with today. John's vision. It's the last book of the Bible, and I'll call your attention to just a few verses. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The tree in paradise connected to the tree on which the prince of life gave his life, one hand stretching towards the Edenic garden, the other to the everlasting paradise. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in that city, and the servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. But be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. In the meantime, you and I are called to be faithful and fruitful. That's what Revelation is all about. After all, you're going to suffer for 10 days. Your vindication is going to be an eternal, everlasting vindication. I close with just a personal anecdote. I wrote a book called The Apocalypse Code, and quite frankly, if you want to look at my books, you can go to equip.org. I'm not here to promote books. Whatever books I've had, I've given them away. But when I wrote that book, the pushback was enormous. There are some here today that I recognize that have blazed the trail before me. Dr. Gary Burge, Colin Chapman, Stephen Sizer. They have known what it takes to stand on this platform saying these things in this time. They have blazed the trail. They are the heroes. 
But let me say this. When I wrote my book, I saw the full force of Christian Zionism. The pushback that I got was enormous. I had been privileged to sell, not metaphorically, but literally millions of books. My publishers immediately warned me to lay off this subject because it was going to hurt book sales. And with 12 children, that mattered. <laughs> Jerry Falwell at the time called pastors to disinvite me from their platforms, pastors and megachurches that I had spoken in for years and years and years. I was asked to resign from boards. Our ministry took a hit in the millions of dollars, no hyperbole, directly attributed to this issue. And what I want to say in the face of this, it's been echoed before, at the end of the day, let's not build walls, let's build bridges. And the reason for this The reason for this ultimately is that as Christians we stand together shoulder to shoulder in the battle for life and truth based on the essentials of the historic Christian faith. In essentials unity, non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity. So we can debate this issue, but we ought to do it in a collegial fashion. And if we're not heard and we suffer, Great is your reward in heaven. Thank you for your attention and for inviting me to this incredible conference.